Welcome to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Designed for everyone interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Covering food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and today it is my absolute delight to introduce you to Nina Simons, co-founder and chief relationship officer at Bioneers. Nina is an award-winning author, speaker, teacher, and leader of the Bioneers Every Woman's Leadership Program. Throughout her career spanning the nonprofit, social entrepreneurship, corporate, and philanthropic sectors, Nina has worked with nearly a thousand women leaders across disciplines, race, class, age, and orientation to create conditions for mutual learning, trust, and leadership development. Her book, Nature, Culture, and the Sacred, A Woman Listens for Leadership, won top Nautilus Awards, and along with her husband and partner, Kenny Osabel, Nina received the revered Goy Peace Award for pioneering work to promote nature-inspired innovations for restoring the earth and our human community. Nina, it is such a delight to share this time with you. Thank you so I, much for being with us. Oh, Mira, it's my pleasure. And I'm noticing as I listen to you that it's getting easier for me to hear my intro and not flinch. That's a wonderful <laughs> thing. That's a yeah. wonderful thing. Because owning our accomplishments is, mm -hmm. is such an, and our gifts, yeah. is such an important thing. Yeah. And I'm reflecting on the title of your book, which I happen to have right here. Everybody go read this book, buy this book, read this book, share it. A woman, it's nature, culture, and the sacred with the um, tagline, a woman listens for leadership. And you have had a unique experience in life with your 25 plus years with pioneers, meeting leaders and innovators in the human development and environmental development space all over the world. You've had the advantage of so many different perspectives, which makes your perspective so deeply informed. And I love that you say a woman listens for leadership. And I think in this time of upheaval and change, we're shifting paradigms from a very um, patriarchal dominated sort of culture to a respect and emergence, reemergence of the feminine. And I want to understand in your leadership journey, what has it been to listen for leadership with all these people that you've been exposed to? Mm. Well, uh, what a good question, Mira. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that quite that way. Um, I think that as I began to discover in my early 40s how my gender had influenced my sense of possibilities and my own path and journey in life. I, because perhaps of Bioneers informing me with a kind of whole system view, I was also aware not only of how my personal gender affected me, but how the biases of a patriarchal culture had affected me and perhaps other women and men all at the same time, and informed how those biases had informed our policies and our governance and our institutions. And so I became simultaneously committed 
to the leadership of women, but also to what I called restoring the feminine um, in us all. And what I mean by that is that um, as human beings, I think we are endowed with many more capacities than our culture tends to honor. And so uh, what I, again, to be more specific, what I mean is that in our bias toward things we associate with the masculine, um, we tend to be focused on uh, what's visible rather than what's invisible. We tend to be focused on uh, progress while ignoring tradition and history. We tend to be focused on uh, mm, <laughs> light rather than dark. And uh, we tend to have lauded the perception of our minds over our ability to perceive with our bodies, our hearts, and our intuition. And so for me, listening for leadership has meant not only observing how I've been affected by some of the hundreds and hundreds of leaders that I've witnessed over the years through Bioneers and noticing acutely which of them really inspires me and why you know and and then looking for patterns as i began to explore how i think that everyone alive on earth right now has an opportunity to redefine and reinvent what leadership means and how it operates and i think that that's part of transcending and transforming a culture that's been informed not only by patriarchy but by capitalism and colonialism and racism and all the rest. And um, so for me, listening for leadership has meant listening with my whole body and noticing if something comes to me in a dream or what I perceive in nature that wants to inform my understanding of leadership for this time. Um, so leadership has become a kind of compass point for me in exploring how are we growing into new models of leadership? How are we co-creating new models of leadership that don't depend on win-lose paradigms, that are not um, hierarchically informed and based on judgment and blame and uh, uh, right and wrong and binaries, um, but in fact that can appreciate nuance and uh, and change and actually embrace change rather than shy away from it. So listening for leadership for me, I mean, I think in its, you know, in one of its briefest summary forms, the reemergence of the feminine asks us to listen a lot more than we talk and to listen with humility and an open heart for how other perspectives can inform our own. Because I think in this time, imagining that we know all the answers and uh, the word that I learned from Terry Tempest Williams of certitude, Certitude is one of our nemesis, nemeses right now, and something to be avoided at all cost. So anything we think we're absolutely certain about, we should be wary of. Wow, you spoke so much, so much, and <laughs> there's so many paradoxical or um, polar, rather, comparisons there. Mm -hmm. and. I think we can surmise a notion of what this new paradigm of leadership is from what you were saying. Uh, typically, traditionally, leaders have been the ones that had that certitude, right? Mm -hmm. that, that were standing out in front of the crowd and leading everyone forward to a certain destination. And one thing that you didn't say that I think is deeply implied is 
a distinction also between doing and being. Yeah. And that much of the circumstance that we face globally now is a re a result of mm. doing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and this separation, this um this worship of the rational mm. as all powerful uh with with a disconnection to being and heart and other dimensions of intelligence yes exactly well put dear thank you for filling in my gaps <laughs> and you know another piece of it is that uh you know, the old model of leadership looks a little like a cult, right? Where there's there's one person who has the answers, who's leading the way, and typically they have been conferred their authority from some external source. They either have a PhD or they've got a job title that gives them authority, or they've inherited wealth perhaps, you know, but one way or another, they have this external authority. And what I found when I really began exploring all of the leaders that I most admired was that they were all motivated by an inner authority, by an inner connection with something much larger than themselves that said, I want to serve that. And they didn't necessarily know how they were going to serve that when they started. They only knew that there was a calling and they responded to that calling. And that's where the element of uh, secular spirituality, if you will, and activism and leadership converge, I think, is that you know, the, the leadership that I'm most inspired by is in service to mother life. And, uh, and it often I found after working with, I don't know, hundreds of women leaders, often we don't know how we're going to serve when we start. We only know that we care about what we care about and we've got to serve what we love and feel, um, and feel and, and cherish. And I think that's where that's where sacred activism and leadership really um, can serve us. As you're speaking that, I'm getting another really big distinction is that mm. traditionally leadership has been ego based. It's been based mm. in the knowledge and wisdom or lack thereof yeah. of the person <clears throat> who was the leader. And what I'm hearing you say is that the leaders mm. you most admire are actually following a calling. Yeah. They are serving a calling that is greater than themselves, that is beyond themselves. And that's that brings us into the realm of the question of spirituality. And you mentioned sacred... Um, uh, secular. Thank you. <laughs> secular, <laughs> I know. Secular spirituality. And um, I think I, I'd love to hear you speak more about the inter interaction of spirituality with this new leadership. Because mm. it, along with the things that have been reviled historically by patriarchal culture, particularly in leadership and areas of credibility are emotionality, spirituality, intuition, all yeah. of those things have been and embodiment and and body knowledge to yes not only exiled but reviled yes. yes and so this new integration of these elements i'd love you to speak more about that well you know i'm in a deep inquiry about it myself right now so i feel as though while life has given me many opportunities to experience that integration of the sacred with activism, um, I have not studied their, their intersectionality as much as I'm looking forward to. And I'm actually offering an online class to help explore with the people who come 
what does that intersection look like and how can we understand it better and embrace it fully? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think that in this time, we of so much churning and roiling, as you mentioned in your opening, uh, Mira, that we have as much unlearning to do as we have learning to do. And there is so much of our what our culture has embedded within us, consciously or unconsciously, that is damaging and self-limiting for us, and that we can't afford to abide in this time when the existential crises that we face on social levels and on environmental levels are so dire and so urgent. And you know, one of them, as you mentioned, has been the false polarization between doing and being, you know, and I, I remember in my early years really having this sort of snooty feeling about people who spent their time meditating and studying spirituality and being following a guru, you know, and I remember thinking like, I don't need that. Um, and and what I've noticed as I've begun really exploring that intersection is that every major decision point in my life has been informed by a calling, you know, what I referred to earlier. And one of the biggest ones, which was a total surprise to me, happened um, when I was around 30 years old. and. I had gone with my then boyfriend to visit a garden in southern New Mexico uh, that was a biodiversity garden. And all of my life, I was raised by artists. I thought for sure my life path would be in the arts. And I was working at the time for an arts organization. And so I went to visit this garden and the master gardener who was growing it gave us a tour through it and it was utterly magnificent it was more diversity than i've ever seen in one place and i mean there were herbs and there were flowers and there were food plants and this was in like in my early 30s 1989 and i remember thinking wow, maybe the Garden of Eden was something like this. And as we walked through the garden, he would introduce us to each plant and he would describe how it was related to the plants around it. And there were sunflowers that were like eight feet tall that felt like they watched us as we walked through the garden. And there were, you know, bumblebees and birds and a riot of colors and then he invited us to taste and so we started tasting like whole societies of tomatoes and you know amaranth and quinoa this was back in the days when no one had heard of quinoa and it was these gorgeous braids of grain glistening in the midday sun and my senses were just ecstatic and then he started explaining to us why he was growing this biodiversity garden as a failsafe against extinction in the food supply because all the mom and pop seed companies that had been breeding for flavor and nutrition were getting gobbled up by multinational corporations and that there was a real threat to the human food supply on the planet and by the time i walked out of that garden I felt like the natural world tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're working for me now. And I had no idea what that meant. And I was kind of um, terrified, honestly, Mira, because I, I almost failed science all the way through college, right? And I was like, no, and I grew up in New York City and I don't know anything about farming or gardening. And what happened as a result of that visit was that my boyfriend went collaborated with this master gardener to form a company called seeds of change and 
I quit my job at the Santa Fe Chamber Music Festival and went to work for Seeds of Change as its marketing director and communications and learned how to write a business plan and learned how to negotiate seed contracts and embarked on the steepest learning curve of my life. And it was a very sacred time for me because I felt like I was serving the sacred biodiversity of life itself. And what could be more important than that? So I had endless energy and I really loved it. It was an amazing chapter in my life. But that was an example where, you know, I had this calling out of the blue. And really since then I've remembered how all the way through my childhood, nature was my solace. Nature was where I went for comfort when I was emotionally roiling or disturbed or when my parents were getting divorced, you know. And um, so I've been on a, on a mission to serve mother life since then, which has expanded the tree of my sense of purpose with the awareness of uh, gendered reality and a racialized reality and a, you know, a, all of this hierarchicalized um, culture that we inherited and, and learning that I had the agency to cultivate myself into who I believe my soul brought me here to become. Because I thought the one thing I know I don't want at the end of my life is to have a regret about not becoming who I was meant to be. And so what you see is so far the result of those efforts. But it is, I mean, it's true what you say about the old model being egoically fed and the newer model being about service, but it's not selfless service. I think the old model was always about sacrificing the self for the good of the whole. And I think the new model has to integrate love of self because I do believe that what we're seeing in the world is a projection of the way that we tend to treat ourselves. And if we can't love ourselves, how can we love each other and love the world back into whole, wholeness and health? Wow. Wow. <laughs> so talking about, we, we started that conversation with talking about uh, secular spirituality. Mm. And you talked about doing what we came here to do. And I have an underlying credo, belief, whatever you want to call it, that we each came here with a unique purpose. Mm -hmm. And again, not selfless service, but finding that calling, that deep soul calling and serving that. I, I operate on this hypothesis that that is our deepest service to life. Mm -hmm. as we serve mm -hmm. that soul calling. And yes. so... You were talking about unlearning. Uh -huh. And I think that for so many of us, the path to finding that soul calling is unlearning mm -hmm. what I'm going to call social inheritance, mm -hmm. whether it's from our families or from our culture. Yeah. To, it, we inherit ideas of how things are. And we were yeah. never taught, particularly as, chi as children, to question because what we were presented with was reality. It just was what, how things were. Yeah. And then we've grown into adulthood and still haven't questioned those things. We, uh, we imprinted them. They're not us. Yeah. They're not yeah. our own. Yeah. And I have recently been experimenting with this with my clients in my coaching practice to ask that they recognize the patterns that they have assimilated as patterns and not as them. Yeah. And to see what freedom then emerges in our ability to choose and to say, well, wait a second, that isn't mine. That yeah. isn't me. Yeah. And I, I can recognize it, but I don't have to be at the effect of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
um, to we often need to do that in order to give ourselves the courage. Like you said, it was terrifying to follow that calling and you had the courage to do it. We often have to release ourselves from these social inheritances in yes. order to step into that because it doesn't make sense in so many ways so often. You know, it's like financial suicide, it looks like, or or um, social suicide in many ways. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm wondering, well... I'm wondering more about what ha what happened with uh, Seeds of Change and how you moved into Bioneers and <laughs> and your calling and your experience of releasing those social inheritances. Mm. Whew. Well, um, I'm not fully at liberty to talk about what happened with Seeds of Change. Okay. What I can say is that it was the subject of a hostile takeover. Mm -hmm. And and so I experienced the loss of something that I cared about so deeply. And because of the level of power differential involved, um, I was not at liberty to talk about it. And so it was assumed that we sold it, which we didn't. And, um, and I think, you know, <laughs> one of the things I'm excited to be exploring is how the challenges that mother life brings us are often while we have conditioning or habits to try to avoid them, often they're exactly what we need to strengthen us. And, you know, one of the habits and conditioning that I'm working with right now is noticing the bias within myself about doing versus resting. And I'm noticing that you know, I've recently had a real vacation, the first in a long time, and it was wonderful. And I got to, oh, thank you. It was amazing. And thankfully, I feel like I, I remembered, it's like riding a bicycle, even though it's been a long time, I remembered how to relax and be and, uh, and listen for my body's guidance for what I wanted. And I remembered that one of my favorite mentors taught me that the feminine thrives in spaciousness. And after that vacation, I have been realizing, oh, I want to reclaim more spaciousness in my life. And the thing, the habit that I have that runs contrary to that is having a very long to-do list and overproducing and feeling like I have to perform at an A++ level or I will not be doing my best. And I think that that's a product of the kind of conditioning you're talking about, you know, and I'm just noticing like uh, one of my guides said to me recently, you know, I think that many of us in the human sphere are in a process of deep change. I mean, the earth is asking us to change. Humanity is asking us to change. And, and one of my guides said to me recently, you know, when an animal is molting, it doesn't do anything else. When a snake is shedding its skin, it's not hunting and eating at the same time. It's just being in the change. And so I'm noticing that, and I'm noticing that, you know, to cycle back to the question of sacred activism um, or spiritually informed activism, I think part of what I'm wrapping my heart around is the idea that activism doesn't require action. Activism can be 
the meditations, can be the thought forms that you're projecting, can be the relationship you're cultivating with yourself, with a tree, with another species, with your family. Um, and, and that there are, I really agree with you, Mira, that we each come with our own assignment. And that one of the most enlivening and joyful things I can imagine, and it's what I want to dedicate my life to doing, is helping other people find their way to their own assignment and liberating them from all the I'm not enoughs and all the shoulds and all the self judgment and all the ugh, you know, that comes from that to be able to say to trust that there is guidance that lives within each one of us that actually is connected to our source. And, you know, I grew up with a family that was atheist or agnostic. Um, basically, they were assimilating Jews and there was not a, any religious training in my childhood. And so it took me until my 20s to begin to discover the power of investing in the invisible world, the power of practicing um, forms of meditation or sitting, um, the power of developing some consciousness about uh, witnessing myself rather than being completely identified with everything I think and feel and believe. And uh, it's a very powerful thing. So, so between that and activism not having to be a doing thing, but a being thing, perhaps, you know, different for each of us, um, there's so many forms of it. And if we cannot judge the particular form we are meant to express, but trust it, what a gift that would be to the whole world. I so agree. I, I couldn't help, as you're speaking, to be thinking of the field. Mm. And I think we're moving from the paradigm of a mechanistic universe to a holistic, intelligent universe. Yeah. And we talk about how we're connected to everything more and more, the notion of Gaia and our interrelationship, as we understand more of nature and science, we see that it's all interwoven, inextricably interwoven. And when we talk about being, the state of our awareness and our being impacts the field. Absolutely. And so that is yeah. in itself activism. Yeah. as we're influencing the field that is emanating and and integrating everything. Yeah. And I know that not that long ago, certainly as I was growing up, that kind of talk would be just considered woo-woo. Um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now we're finding more actual scientific uh, validation of yes. the truth of it. Yes. And so when you were talking about the um, lack of self-worth that so many people have and this addiction to doing, it's very much a function of the mechanistic notion of things where everything is external, where our value is, uh, is determined by our external accomplishments or yes. positions or all these externalities that identify us rather than that internal connection you were talking about and releasing what I'm calling the social inheritances and being able to connect more deeply with our own essence. Yeah. What if we came in knowing we were enough? Yeah. Wow. What would we do? Our choices would be entirely different, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, I, I've just been reading a Tibetan teacher from a long lineage. And part of what he speaks to is the conditioning of the mind. And he calls it a regime. 
And I thought that was so interesting because here we are in a time of needing a regime change, right? Just as we need a regime change in this country, in global geopolitics, in terms of the climate and human survival on the planet, we need a regime change within ourselves that actually frees our minds to actually listen for the guidance of our hearts, our bodies, our intuition, our dream time, and our ancestors. Yeah. You know, I had uh, one very revelatory experience um, with a Peruvian native teacher named Oscar Miro Quesada. And he led, I was in a, a year long training with about 80 or 90 other people. And he led an eight hour long ceremony. And it ended at like three in the morning. And at the very end of it, he said, if you remember only one thing from our time together, remember this consciousness creates matter language creates reality ritual creates relationship and those nine words have been uh, central to my discovery of my sense of purpose to my staying connected with what i experience as the divine or the sacred and to practicing becoming who I'm born to be. Because I think, you know, all of those patterns, I think of them as habits, you know, they're habits of our minds. And just like any habit, in order to change them, we have to practice. And uh, practice, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> Beautiful. As the old saying goes, yes. Yeah, I got chills when you spoke those nine words. Mm, they're very powerful. Mm. And I've used them I've used them in so many ways to inform my own learning and my teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about Bioneers. Tell us how you <laughs> and Kenny got started with Bioneers. Well, Bioneers was originally Kenny's brainstorm. I have to give credit where it's due. He named it. And it started because while we were doing Seeds of Change, we were both in a, a deep phase of research. And Kenny in particular, because he was an investigative journalist and he was learning about biodiversity and bioremediation and bioremediation is the use of natural systems to detoxify the air and soil and water and what he was finding was that there were amazing people who had learned by mimicking nature and learned from nature how to heal nature and how to heal with nature and because perhaps uh, we live in the Southwest, and we have both always had a really strong affinity with indigenous peoples and cultures. Um, he recognized that indigenous peoples were the first pioneers. And uh, pioneers came to pass because he was in a hot tub with a male friend, and he was bemoaning that he was learning about these brilliant innovators that no one knew about. And the friend said, why don't you have a conference? And Kenny said, I've never been to a conference. It sounds boring. Why would I do that? And the friend said, here's a grant. Go have a conference. And uh -huh. Kenny, Kenny knew that I had a theater background. And I had never been to a conference either. And so he asked me to help him produce a conference. And it sounded a little sciencey to me, but I agreed. And I did what I do, you know, I brought beauty to it and a lot of relational intelligence. And, uh, and I remember sitting there at my first conference with my mouth hanging open because I was so inspired by the people on the stage. And I thought, well, these are the leaders I want to serve with my communication skills. And so that was in 1990. And back then, it was called the Seeds of Change Conference, but it became the Bioneers Conference very soon after. 
and it has continued to evolve and grow um, so that each year we have an annual conference that has anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 people show up and a very active indigeneity program, which is really at the heart of Bioneers. And last year we had people from 125 sovereign nations um, show up for the indigeneity work. And, um, and it's just been this extraordinary evolving uh, you know, what we what we realized early on was that we could reach a lot more people if we recorded the conference, both with audio and with video. And so we now are in, I think, year 17 or 18 of producing a radio series that wins awards every year, and it's podcast too, and there are videos online, and there's a very active online community. And we've just started Bioneers Learning, which is offering online courses um, because people forever have been saying to us, okay, I'm really inspired and really jazzed. What do I do next? And for years we said, well, we can't tell you what to do next. It's hard enough for us to know what we're supposed to do next. But we realized that there are some practical things that we can offer that other people don't seem to be. So we're doing that now too. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful organization that I'm incredibly proud and honored to serve. And so grateful we've kept it alive all these years. Well, so are we. <laughs> Can you uh, tell our listeners how to find all these resources that you're just Oh, with? sure. Sure, sure. Well, Bioneers.org is the simplest way. And in fact, if you go to Bioneers.org slash NCS book, you can download a free introduction to my Nature, Culture, and the Sacred book. And, uh, and also, you'll find on the website, you can sign up for the newsletter, and then you'll know about everything we do. And it only comes every couple of weeks, and it's really rich with good information. So it's, it, you know, what's interesting about Bioneers, I think, is that it, it's <clears throat> not solely an environmental conference. It's an environmental conference that recognizes that as humans, we are part of the environment, not apart from it. And therefore, everything about reinventing civilization is part of Bioneers and addressing racial injustice and gender justice and all of the things about leadership and marrying the inner with the outer. You know, as you were saying earlier, it occurred to me just to mention, Mira, that I always find it helpful to remember that Carl Jung said the masculine is associated with the external and the feminine is associated with everything internal. And so part of reclaiming balance is to validate our internal lives and to help heal our relationships with ourselves in order to be better beacons of light and love and forgiveness in the world and connection and to help transform everything that is broken out there. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you can, if you remember who your first speakers were. I know it was a long time ago, but I just figured Oh boy. Out. Well, yeah, I kind of do. I mean, you know, John Todd was one of our first speakers, oh, he's right? A and Paul Stamets was a very early speaker. This was before anyone had really ever heard of either of them. Um, and there was a, a native man who was a governor at Acoma Pueblo. And I remember in 1992, we had a panel of native leaders speaking about commemorating the 500 year anniversary of Columbus coming to this land. Wow. And I remember sitting there and hearing this man say, uh, he said, 500 years ago, you came and we welcomed you with open arms. If you came again today, we would do the same. And I, I just 
remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I have so much to learn from these people. That's extraordinary. And he meant it with every cell of his being. And um, so I think, I think in addition to learning how to live in right relationship with nature, um, learning <clears throat> how to be good humans <coughs> is something we could learn from indigenous peoples. 100 percent yeah uh in the conversation that we've had prior to this interview we talked about leadership and toxic leadership mm. and we've sort of alluded to that a little bit in this conversation uh, you've you've encountered thousands of leaders and i'm wondering if you'd be willing to share your observation of some of the pitfalls of mm. leadership mm. and how sure. in moving into this new paradigm, we can be mm. alert to those mm. pitfalls. Mm. Well, I think that question is connected to something you observed earlier, Mira, about ego. And you know, what I have observed in leaders that I can be, on the one hand, admiring of their thinking, but uninspired by their being, is that I think, you know, we are products of a, a celebrity culture. And everybody kind of wants their five minutes of fame. And what I've noticed is that you know, celebrity is like a badly addictive drug. And, uh, and what I've been cultivating in myself, you know, I had an, I've had a few experiences recently where things have happened because of things that I've done that I got no credit for. And mm -hmm. there is this private glow that I experience, it's like having a sun in my belly, you know, and there's something so sweet about that. And um, so one of the pitfalls certainly is that celebrity kind of addiction. And I think, you know, one of the things I've become really alert to is that the leaders I admire are leaders because they lift others up and not and don't put others down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the surefire red flags for me is anybody who is elevating themselves by putting other people down. Um, you know, I do think that there's a definite need for discernment in this time on behalf of all of us because there is so much untruth being told and so much that is deceptive and and you know detrimental to life but um but i don't think that there you know i think that every human has light and dark and good and evil in us and we all have the capacity to do harm and frankly I'm not sure there's a human alive who hasn't done harm. Maybe the Dalai Lama, I'm not sure, but you know, really. Um, and so I think um, the leaders that I most admire not only lift other people up, but have a sense of, they practice inclusivity, they practice compassion and a certain amount of empathy. I think that, you know, there are studies that have shown now that as people get more power and more money, they become less empathic. And that uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, homeless people report that when they're out begging on the street, the fancy expensive cars never give them money and the beat up older cars often give them money. And you know, and that's actually been proven in scientific experiments. So one of the pitfalls of leadership is not only celebrity, but imagining that power is something that belongs to you. Mm. And 
right? And I think power comes through us. It doesn't belong to us. Power is life's and part of the sacred and mother life's. And so that's another pitfall that I would name, you know, certainly well, is imagining that we own power. Yes. So I, you've talked about mother life. Mm. And and um, one of the things that I've recently been playing with is an identity for myself as life expressing itself through this unique vehicle. Yes. And that reminds me that it's not me. Yeah. I get to be... I get the privilege of being this vehicle. And yes. It it opens up there's it opens up so much freedom actually. Yeah. yeah. Because I can serve. I can serve that energy. I can allow the power to flow through me in its own expression yes. without becoming um attached to it. Yes. And you know what what that makes me think of, Mira, is that I've heard many Native people refer to the idea of becoming a hollow bone, oh, you know, yes. right? Wow. Because you want, you want the, the, the guidance of mother life, of ancestors, of dream time, of star beings to come through you and not to be obstructed by you. Yes, and exactly. right. And that's beautiful. And the other thing that occurred to me as I was listening to you is it can release us from the obligation to prove ourselves. Exactly. You exactly. Know? That's why because, it's so profoundly freeing. Yes. We don't have to prove that we're good enough or big enough or smart enough or anything enough. We have to be ourselves and we have to be open to receiving. And the paradox is the less we are who we believe we are, the more we can be who we came here to be. Yes, <laughs> that's a really good point because who we imagine ourselves to be is probably the product of the old regime, yes. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, so... <sighs> Tell me what I should have asked you, Nina, in this remarkable time we've shared together that I didn't ask. Uh, you know, the thing that came up for me, Mira, that I just wanted to name, I don't know that you should have asked me it, but it feels important to say to the people who are wise enough to be listening to your podcast um, <laughs> <laughs> and discerning enough is that one of the great gifts I've experienced in my own reclaiming of who I was born to be is um, developing a healthier relationship to my emotions and realizing that mother life endowed us with emotions for good reasons and that the fact that our conditioning or the old regime or our habitude has told us don't cry in public don't be weak don't show your fear you know all these crazy things don't grieve excuse me i mean i am convinced that if we had public rituals for grieving we could diminish the amount of violence in the world overnight. And, you know, so uh, one of my great teachers in that has been Carla McLaren, who is a brilliant, brilliant teacher who wrote a book called The Language of Emotions. And um, she's wonderful because she really investigated and interviewed her own emotions to understand what their real purposes are and it's a beautiful beautiful process of reclaiming our human wholeness to reclaim our emotions and you know she says that anger is here to tell us when a boundary has been trespassed and what an incredibly important 
useful thing to know. I mean, in this time when newborn babies are being born with over 200 man-made chemicals in their bodies, how can we not be furious about that? Um, and if we were, you know, if the old regime had endowed us with knowing how to value and express our anger, I have to imagine that women would have been out in the streets in thousands upon thousands upon thousands, and we would have helped make change a lot sooner. So let us free up and honor our needs for sorrow and grief and anger and, and all of our emotions because they free up our capacity to feel joy as well and, uh, and serenity, which are all part of the spectrum, you know? So it's, it's why what I write about in my book is what I call full spectrum leadership. How do we reclaim all of our human capacities, regardless of what gendered body we might be in? You know, in your conversation around emotions, we're inclined or we've been conditioned to judge them. Yeah. And as we judge them, we repress them. Yeah. And what I've discovered is curiosity is a remarkable antidote to judgment. Yes. And if we can uh. recognize our emotions and be curious, they are messages from our emotional intelligence to yes. educate us to or alert us to something that we ought be paying attention to. When we repress them and deny them, they often manifest physically. Yes. And also in uh, acting out kind of behavior, right? Yes. Oh, totally. And projecting, and which projecting. we're seeing so much of right now. Yes. Yep, exactly. And, and, you know, they, they contribute to the kind of story making that, you know, we humans are amazing story making creatures. And that's both a gift and a challenge. And uh, the stories that say we are less than or we're not as good as, you know, we what I found somewhere along my process was that I had to give up comparing myself to anyone but myself. And that was a hugely freeing discovery. That's oh, genius, actually. right. Genius. It's great. Well, thank you. <laughs> it sure helped me. And um, I'm, you know, I'm happy and humble and wondering and curious about who I'm becoming next. As life is emerging through you. Exactly. That's exactly. the other thing, too, is that notion of being allows life to be an unfolding adventure. Yeah. Instead of yeah. some place we have to get to, to prove something somehow. Yes. To the external world, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. life, we live in constant discovery. It's a whole different yeah. perspective, right? Yes, it sure is. And normalcy and sameness are deeply overrated. You know, Zach Bush, the interesting doctor, you know, suggests that humans are the only species on this planet that cultivates monoculture. That actually, right, because biodiversity is the source of innovation. It's and the strength. And strength and resilience. Exactly. Yes. So <laughs> let us let us not cultivate ourselves to be monocultures, but to accept and embrace the full spectrum of uniqueness and and magic that wants to come through us. And on that note, I you mentioned magic. That's my favorite. And <laughs> just, I just want to say what a tremendous delight it has been to have this conversation with you. And you are you are the embodiment of leadership yeah. that I revere where you have this deep humility and deep perspective and inclusion and curiosity and um, openness. So I just thank you so much for what you're doing in the world, who you are, what you're cultivating, and I'm so honored to have had you join us today. Well, Mira, 
I feel the same. I feel like, you know, I'm honored to be your curly soul sister. <laughs> and <laughs> and I'm so thrilled that we've discovered each other. And I look forward to many years of learning with and from and around each other. And oh, thank you too. so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you to all of our listeners. You carry the torch. We rely on you um, together, together. And also deep thanks to my partner in crime here at Sustainability Now, Scott Billy, who's also our producer. Mm. And that's it for today. Until next time, live your best life. Love the world around you. And together <sighs> we can save the world. And ourselves. And ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.